So we are going. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning. Now we're going to the second presentation. Um, so we have a topic of seizure among pediatric population. Uh, what not to miss at emergency department. So this topic will be presented by Dr. Ahmad Ritaudin bin Muhammad. Uh, so Dr. Ahmad Ritaudin bin Muhammad is a consultant pediatric neurologist uh, from Hospital Tunku Aziza Kuala Lumpur. Uh, he is also a secretary, chapter of Child Neurology and Developmental Pediatrics, Malaysian Society of Neurosciences, and also a community member for Epilepsy Council Malaysia and Malaysian Society of Neurosciences. Nina for... Hang on a second, hang on a second. Okay, the term can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. We're gonna have to leave uh, the other. Yeah. Uh, Tamat, are you there? Mm, Dr. Ahmad Ritaudin, are you there? Mm. Oh, I think... Uh, yeah, I think he got disconnected. <laughs> yeah, just okay, we just wait for a while. I think he will join back. Yeah. Okay, is he in? Um, Falah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, you're okay. Uh, we just wait for Dr. Ahmad yeah, for a while. Yeah. I think his line is not so good. Mila Malaysia upgrade 5G, yeah? Mm. So for those who uh, didn't uh, manage to watch the first session, uh, you can catch it. Uh, from our YouTube channel, uh, sorry, from the Facebook page. You can follow us on, at NeuroEMSIG. NeuroEMSIG. Hi, Dr. Ahmad. Hi, sorry. Was a bit, okay. was in a bit of a twilight zone just now. <laughs> okay. Right. okay, without further ado, Dr. Ahmad is out in. The floor is yours. Okay, let's restart. Firstly, thank you for inviting me, Dr. Nina, and, uh, and thank you all for, for uh, sparing your Saturday morning uh, to attend this uh, course. Um, can I just uh, uh, have a show of hands? Uh, those who are emergency physicians, I just, just want to make sure that, that you know, we are interactive and uh, I've got a few, few hands there. Eh, takkan satu je. Two, three. Oh, the, the hands are a bit late in coming up. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we know the uh, we know the uh, wave and thumbs up function works. Um, uh, let's see if the if the chat box works. Um, can can people uh, just type what they had for buka puasa yesterday? McDonald's. Ish, 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 ish. Kurma, laksa, mi kari, nasi ayam Thai. Interesting. Okay, we know the chat function also works. Great. I'm just going to share my uh, PowerPoint now. Go home. Move this bit. Okay, so so I've been asked to talk about you know what what not to miss uh, in in ED, but I've I've changed the title slightly, so and uh, added you know, in addition to what things you shouldn't be missing in ED, what things you shouldn't be misdiagnosing in ED as well. 
So this is not, you know, hard core emergency stuff, uh, but these are uh, cases that you will see in, in your ED department. Uh, but before we start, I thought um, I'd take a few minutes just to um, um, highlight to you the changes in, in the terminologies when we, when we talk about uh, seizures. Um, uh, so this is the latest uh, seizure classification by the International League Against Epilepsy, also known as ILAE, that's, that's uh, published in 2017. And, and I hope you know, we will all uh, try and, and use these terms as much as possible so that we know, you know we're all on the same, same, you know, same page. Um, and in this classification, seizures have, have uh, been broadly classified to those with a focal onset, uh, so, or a generalized onset, or if you're not sure whether the seizure start, started focally or, or you know, in, a, in a generalized manner, you, you just say you know, it's a seizure of an unknown onset. That's, that's perfectly um, acceptable. Because determining seizure onset, sometimes you can get clues from, from uh, clinical history, but, but sometimes you need, you need EEG, you need to be recording seizures during the EEG to be certain whether a seizure is of focal onset or generalized onset. And sometimes even with EEG attached, you may struggle uh, to decide. So that's, that's perfectly okay. But it does help when, when you know whether a seizure is uh, of focal onset or, or generalized onset. So if you just look at the focal onset seizures, uh, you, can, you can then divide it into focal onset seizures with, with uh, retained awareness. So in the old days, this, this will be called your simple partial seizure. We don't want to use that now. We don't want to use partial seizure anymore. You know, if you're, if you're referring to partial seizure, say it's a focal seizure. And, and you can have a focal seizure with impaired awareness, a previously known as a complex partial seizure. So, so try not to use that, okay? Uh, if you're talking to neurologists and all that, you know, you say, oh, I think this boy has got a focal onset seizure with impaired awareness, and I'm sure they'll be impressed. <clears throat> And, and you know you can then further further qualify or further describe the seizures as to whether the focal seizures had any motor manifestations or not, uh, whether there are any automatisms. So automatisms are uh, you know movements, automatic movements, either involving the mouth. That's when you get some chewing-like movements like that, or or, or your hands, you know. Where, where they might be, you know, be fidgeting, they might be playing with a button or something like that. Or you can have, you know, proper focal clonic seizures. So you have uh, jerking on one side of your limbs. Uh, uh, or you can have hypermotor or hyperkinetic seizures, uh, which is often uh, seen in patients with frontal lobe epilepsy and so on. And you can also have uh, focal seizures with non-motor manifestations. And listed there are some uh, of the uh, subtypes of that, including those with autonomic seizures. So patients with uh, autonomic seizures tend to have, um, um, you know, uh, changes in, in their heart rate. They may have tachycardia. Uh, vomiting is a common feature in, in um, uh, autonomic seizures. Uh, and some patients with uh, focal onset seizures just have, you know, behavioral arrest or, or some, some unusual uh, sensory changes. Now, under generalized onset, similarly, you can have motor manifestations. You know, the most, the most classical example of a, a generalized seizure is your generalized tonic-clonic seizure, right? Um, uh, uh, but you can also have, you know, other uh, motor seizures of generalized onset, including tonic seizures, uh, myoclonic seizures. And, and with the uh, non-motor uh, seizures, it's, this, is, this is the uh, typical example of your Epson seizures, right? Uh, and, and your Epson seizures of generalized onset will be associated with the 3 hertz spike waves if you, if you had an EEG uh, as well. So, so, so no, no more, you know, uh, you know petit mal or grand mal. Uh, try, try, and use these, uh, try and use these new terms. If you're not sure, as I mentioned, just say, you know, unknown onset, and that's, that's perfectly uh, acceptable. You can still describe what you see. You can still describe the motor components. Uh, I see clonic jerking. I see myoclonic, which is, which is a rapid jerk. You know. 
And one, uh, one other thing I just want to say in this classification is you will notice that epileptic spasms are found under all three categories. You can have epileptic spasms of focal onset, you can have epileptic spasms of generalized onset, and you can have epileptic spasms when you're not sure whether it's uh, focal or generalized. And that's, uh, you know, this epileptic spasm is a peculiar uh, seizure type uh, in children. And, and I'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, that um, uh, later. The next, the next concepts that I just want to share when you're talking about children with, with seizures and epilepsies is, you know, when you have somebody with, with uh, you know, recurrent seizures, uh, unprovoked, so that's epilepsy, right? So epilepsy is recurrent, unprovoked seizure. You don't need an EEG to diagnose somebody with epilepsy, okay? EEG is just to help you define what kind of epilepsy syndrome or, or you know, try and work out what sort of uh, seizure uh, type they have. Uh, so, so but, but once you have somebody with epilepsy, you then want to try and classify as, far, as much as possible what is the epilepsy type. And whenever possible, classify the epilepsy syndrome. Uh, so an example of an epilepsy syndrome is, you know, benign Rolandic epilepsy, uh, which is the most common form of unprovoked seizures in children. So these are kids who are school going, have seizures in their sleep, seizures are, you know, infrequent, um, uh, they are uh, otherwise well, and when they do their EEG, you see centrotemporal spikes. So that's an example of a syndrome, benign Rolandic epilepsy. Is an epilepsy syndrome characterized by focal seizures, mostly in sleep, in otherwise normal kids uh, who have central temporal spikes in their EEG. Um, and once you've worked out, you may or may not work out what, what a syndrome is, you also want to find out, if you can, what is the etiology? Why, why did this, uh, why did this um, patient have seizure? Or why does this patient have this epilepsy syndrome? A syndrome does not necessarily equal to an etiology. So benign Rolandic epilepsy is a syndrome. What is the etiology? We actually don't know. We, we think it's probably genetic or probably something to do with, uh, with you know, uh, the state of the brain during this age where it's just, it's just a bit sensitive and, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it's prone to have uh, seizures and these uh, EEG changes at, at that time. Well, just just to uh, 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 give example of this interaction between epilepsy syndrome and, and etiology, uh, if we take this case of a, a kid who has uh, uh, an infant who has these uh, multiple tubers in the brain, you probably already know the diagnosis, which is uh, which is a tuberous sclerosis complex. But but this uh, this patient during the infancy uh, may have. Um, uh, focal seizures uh, may, may start with, with focal seizures. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, that's the most common uh, presentation uh, of seizures in, in infants, right? Uh, so infants don't get generalized tonic clonic seizures. So, so, you know, if you see clucking, some, uh, uh, an infant coming in and then, and then your, your whoever clucks it, no, oh, this, this patient had generalized tonic clonic seizure. You, you want to you wanna clarify that history because Infants simply do not have the do not have the networks to allow uh, uh, generalized tonic clonic seizures to occur. They probably had the seizure involving you know different parts, so they may have bilateral clonic, or um, uh, you know, but not not the true generalized tonic clonic seizures. But this in this, this neonate who had uh, focal seizures, um, um, you know, early on. As they go through infancy, you know, especially after three, three months of age, their seizure may change into another seizure type. Uh, and, and quite typically, uh, those with you know, underlying structural abnormalities or, or, or genetic abnormalities, uh, the, the seizures tend to evolve into spasms, into epileptic spasms. And that's one point about uh, you know, seizure types your seizure types may change according to age. So it's not, it's, it's, it's a fairly dynamic uh, uh, situation. And if this same patient then 
continues to have seizures that are, that are difficult to treat, they may then develop other seizure types, uh, including you know, tonic seizures, uh, atypical absences, their EEG may also change, and their syndrome may change. So syndromes can also change with age. So when you had spasms, and, and typically when you have spasms, you have uh, EEG showing uh, 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 hip arrhythmia, uh, that may be termed as West syndrome. Uh, but when you're older, when you have multiple seizure types, and you have a different EEG pattern, a slow spike waves, for example, that may be a Lennox-Gastro syndrome. Uh, so, so West syndrome and Lennox-Gastro syndrome are example of epilepsy syndromes. But the etiology is still the same. It's tuberous sclerosis complex. So this TS caused you know, a focal seizure syndrome in neonatal period, West syndrome in infancy, and Lennox-Gastro syndrome you know, later on when, when he was bigger. So I, I hope that, that gives you some, uh, some idea about the interaction between you know, seizure types and epilepsy syndromes and, and etiology. All right, let's, let's get on to the topic of the day, which is uh, what diagnosis is. We'll start with uh, you know, uh, the seizure mimics first. Um, what diagnosis is not to miss. As, as, as you probably, if you've been in pediatric practice, you'll know there's a, there's a wide range of conditions in childhood that can mimic, um, that can mimic uh, seizures. And th these include uh, sleep myoclonus uh, or, or other rhythmic movement disorders. And it, it can be, you know, seizures can be mistaken. Uh, somebody with a Sandifer syndrome with a, with a bad gastroesophageal reflux may, may look like he's having a, a tonic seizure. Uh, shuddering attacks uh, are sometimes uh, mistaken as um, uh, epileptic seizures. Uh, in, in bigger children, you know, breath holding spells, uh, self gratification uh, uh, behaviors, uh, you know, parasomnias, which are, which are events in sleep can sometimes mimic seizures. Um, and then in, in bigger children still, you know, the most common seizure mimic is your syncope. Uh, uh, and sometimes, you know, other things like migraine attacks and even psychogenic uh, non-epileptic seizures can also mimic seizures. So I'm just gonna spend a few minutes uh, showing you some videos and I hope the videos run well. I do hope that we'll get some uh, participation and you can, you can type what you think these movements are. Start with this first one. So this is, uh, uh, maybe where's this, uh, you know, jerks in sleep um, and, and she's doing it uh, and the pa parents were concerned because the jerks are you know quite quite uh, significant um, so just to give you a bit more clues they only occur in sleep you want to try and type some suggestions what do you think it might be maybe it's otherwise well Can I have some um, offers, please? Benign sleep myoclonus of infancy, neonatal sleep myoclonus. Great. I think that was not too hard. So yes, you're 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 correct. Uh, this, this, that was an example of a uh, neonatal sleep myoclonus, and these are repetitive rhythmic uh, myoclonic jerks. They may be single, and they can, they can be quite, quite uh, high amplitude, mimicking real myoclonic jerks. Uh, they may be synchronous, meaning occurring you know, in all limbs at the same time, or asynchronous, meaning you know, occurring one after the other. Usually last for seconds or minutes. Um, they, they, they appear in sleep only, Although sometimes you get a bit confused, the, the confusion occurs when, you know, the, the occurrence uh, uh, appear in the transition stage between sleep and awake. And, and sometimes people may think, oh, oh that's, but, but this, this child had the jerks when he was awake, whereas in fact that was during the transition. Um, uh, it may be provoked by uh, sounds or, or tactile stimuli. So you, when you touch some, some babies who are sensitive, they might, they might jerk. Um, uh, it can start within a few days of birth and 
tend to uh, continue up until uh, six months of age. We don't know why it happens. There's some postulations about you know, immature myelination and things like that. Um, uh, you don't need an EEG, all right? That's, that's the whole uh, point. But, but in, in patients who have had EEG, then sometimes it shows some, some central sharps, which are of no uh, clinical significance and no treatment is necessary. In fact, sometimes uh, it may be a bit more obvious if you give certain medications such as uh, abamazepine. What about this uh, next one? It's also an infant. It was having these, uh, these abnormal movements. They were probably significant enough for, for him to, be, to end up in hospital being monitored. So he's awake there. It's not your sleep microlonus, and they don't look like microlonus anyway. Can I have some offers, please? Oh, what did he do there? Things stopped when the when the legs were held. Ah, there you go again. Infantile spasm. Infantile spasm. Keep the suggestions coming. Rhythmic movement disorder. Any other offers? I give another second. Right, I'm, I'm glad uh, this was brought up. Um, that was that was tremors. Right, so, so, so spasms uh, look different and we, we, we may have some examples later on, uh, but, but these were, these were um, um, uh, uh, tremors, infantile trem tremors and, uh, or jitteriness. And they are, they are a series of recurrent tremors which are, which are involuntary, sometimes rhythmic, uh, uh, mostly of, of, of equal amplitude. Um, there's, there's mainly two types of tremors. There's this one that's of a higher frequency. So you get, you get really fine tremulous movements. And one that's, that's of lower frequency and often higher amplitude. So they tend, they, they sometimes can be mistaken with uh, uh, myoclonic my jerks um, or, or chronic seizures. Um, uh, they are often triggered when startled, crying or upset. Uh, easily stopped by passive flexion or, or gentle touch, just as you saw on the, on the uh, video example. Uh, usually not accompanied by any eye movements or um, autonomic changes. Uh, they are quite common actually in healthy newborns, but they can also be a feature in, in, in babies who've got um, other issues like um, you know, hypoglycemia or, or hypocalcemia. They don't, not seizures, but, but even these babies can have, can have these um, uh, jitteriness, excessive jitteriness, sepsis, HIE in particular, or those with, uh, those with um, um, intracranial hemorrhage and hypothermia. So again, this, was, uh, this is a benign, uh, benign uh, phenomenon. What about this one? Um, we've got a series of three patients, uh, all doing... Uh, Fairly similar thing. Uh, you won't hear any voice because I think I forgot to tick that uh, optimize for video clip. But but you don't need voice for this. You just see this boy. Um, see that? There. 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 Okay. Enough boy. We go on to the other the other patient. There, there, there. Any any suggestions before I go into the last one? Because the last one is quite quite short. Rhythmic movement disorders, spasms, spasms. All right, I'll play the last one. What, what do you think of all these? What do you think of all these uh, babies? Well or unwell? Alert or not? 
inquisitive or not. This particular one looks, uh, looks rather cheeky, this, this boy. Yeah, automatisms. Yeah. These, these, are, these are, in fact, uh, all very well babies who have shuddering attacks. Uh, and these are, this is a disorder that's fairly benign uh, that affects infants and young children. They resemble often shivering and straining. And, and it's, you know, it's not, you know, I, I wouldn't, I'm not too surprised that some, some people uh, attribute this as, uh, or, or, or term, or, or thought they could be spasms. Uh, it can sometimes resemble spasms, but um, uh, babies are usually well. In fact, these babies are often, you know, what look like busy body babies. <laughs> They're so alert and they like to explore their surrounding and all that. And these episodes tend to happen at meal times, as the last example uh, I showed you, or sometimes in uh, when during changing diapers, they can have multiple attacks, sometimes even more than 100 times a, a day. Uh, and they all, all of them resolve when they are when they are bigger. Are these are these uh, shuddering attacks? You think? Whoops! Hang on. Is that a shudder? Another shudder. Another shudder? What do you think? This is the same patient, he's a bit older here. And actually, this, this is even more subtle. There you are. There's a slight head nod. There you are again. There you are again. There's a bit of facial grimacing and then a slight head nod. Any offers? Actually, these are quite subtle. I'll, I'll show you this one, and I hope some of you will get this right. Shudder. Somebody said shudder. If you were referring to the first two videos, I wouldn't blame you. What about, the, what about this last one? Any more offers? Salam attack. Yeah. In fact, these are all spasms. These are all spasms. And, and, and sometimes, and the key to, to diagnosing spasms is it occurs in clusters. All three, all three videos showed events occurring in, in a fairly uh, periodic uh, uh, fashion, periodic cluster. So a bit of a bit of it not. I mean, the, the manifestations can, can be subtle or can be obvious as, as the baby, you know, the, the, the classical salam attack. But the key is the, is the clustering. And it most often occur uh, upon waking. Uh, it, it won't occur in sleep. Um, and, and you can see even on the facial expression of these uh, babies, they're not, they're not as alert as, as well as, as those uh, shuddering babies. Um, so, um, you know, but, but it, it, sometimes, you know, as, as you have seen uh, uh, this exercise today, it can be easily confused. So shudder uh, occurs when, when the child is wide awake, not, not uh, just as they are waking up from sleep. Um, it may be isolated. It can, it can occur in, in series, but it doesn't, they, they tend not to have this very um, uh, periodic pattern occurring, you know, after a few seconds. Uh, in, in a periodic manner. Uh, the child is usually not irritable, development is normal. Uh, and if you see a typical shudder, again, you don't need an EEG. You don't need an EEG to, to diagnose sh shuddering attacks. Just, just video recordings would be enough. Uh, spasms, on the other hand, tend to occur in clusters upon awakening. That's the most classical uh, pattern of uh, spasms. Often the kids are not normal. They are either irritable or they have um, a normal development, unless you picked it up very early. Um, um, and, and when you do an EEG, it, it will be abnormal. Most classically, it might show this uh, hips arrhythmic pattern. 
um, and uh, you know spasms can be due to various uh, underlying conditions. Uh, but you know even now, despite you know many <laughs> uh, many teaching sessions and all that, spasms are are still uh, being uh, picked up late. And in fact, um, our, our colleague did a, did a, um, a survey uh, looking at all the kids who ended up with uh, the spasms and, and, and the interval interval or time lag between the onset of spasms to the correct diagnosis and treatment and the, and the lag is still, is still quite significant. Uh, well, less than half uh, uh, was diagnosed within two weeks of onset and two weeks is a long time. Uh, and some were diagnosed even you know, some months uh, down the line. And it's important for us to, to um, detect and treat spasms effectively because you know every time every delay uh, means uh, poor uh, neurodevelopmental outcome and that's shown in this that's shown in this graph here so i hope uh, you you all uh, can pick up spasms in if these uh, patients end up in your ed what about this last uh, video here it's a child it's on the floor He's just finished crying, actually. So it's a bit still now, it's become a bit stiff. You can see there's perioral cyanosis, and then that's uh, arching, and then he starts breathing, but then has all these uh, you know, abnormal movements. And what, what do you think that was? Breath holding, breath holding, breath holding. Excellent. Excellent. That was easy. Um, so it's breath holding spells are probably a form of uh, yeah, um, maybe syncope, if you like. It's it's to do with you know not enough oxygen getting to the brain. And, and as you know, you've got this cyanotic type where um, um, baby turns blue, stop breathing, and often precipitated by fear, frustration, or minor injury. Um, and uh, uh, sometimes these uh, cyanotic breath holding spells uh, may be due to an underlying anemia uh, and correction of that may, be, may reduce the attacks. You also have this other type uh, uh, where, where the babies appear pale rather than blue. Uh, it may also be precipitated by trivial injury and, and, and it's probably to do with this uh, cardio inhibitory reflex causing cardiac asystole. But both, uh, both uh, um, uh, types are benign and they don't tend to affect uh, neurodevelopment. So if you're in ED, you know, check if you've got this history, you know, just check your FBC, uh, those with, um, and they may not have uh, proper anemia, anemia, but they may still have uh, iron deficiency such that, you know, it might be worth uh, treating these babies with uh, a short course of uh, iron supplements and they should, they should uh, do better with that. With bigger kids, you know, as I mentioned, you can you can the most common mimic uh, to, to seizures is is or, or loss of consciousness is syncope, and you know I'm, I'm sure you've seen tables like this many many times. You know you can sometimes or most of the time work it out from from the history. Um, um, you know syncope usually is it's uh, preceded by this this uh, feeling of palpitation. They may they may feel a bit uh, uh, dizzy. Um, if they have myoclonic jerks, usually the jerks occur before loss of consciousness in proper seizures. Whereas in syncope, the myoclonic jerks occur after, you know, the patient has fallen and, and uh, uh, lost consciousness. Uh, both are usually brief, but syncope even briefer. There shouldn't be any uh, vital sign changes in, in syncope. Uh, you know, proper uh, GTC seizures with loss of consciousness can have a quite quite a long post ictal period, whereas you should um, recover quite quickly um, following a syncope. You know, that, that, that you can try and work out about, you know, whether the eye is rolling back or whatever, but actually the most important thing to determine is the, the history of what the child was doing prior to the event, because syncope will occur in syncopal uh, scenarios, you know, you know, standing for a long time waiting for a turn in clinic to get your vaccine. Uh, you know, uh, there, there are some other unusual uh, syncopal scenarios like um, 
uh, or vas vasovagal attack, like a hair combing syncope. That's that's quite unusual, but but well described. So these are girls with long hair, and they, and they they you know when they comb their hair, uh, the 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 act of touching the comb on on the on the scalp somehow induces a vasovagal attack, and they can have syncope. Uh, you can have stretch syncope. You know when you stretch, and then I don't know maybe maybe you maybe you trigger your vagus nerve, and and you can have a syncope. Uh, because of that, so it's important to try and get um, uh, you know much uh, a, a good history leading to the events, and that's that's not always uh, that's not always possible, of course. Uh, but with syncope, uh, there are there can be some less common features which may may, may uh, make you uh, may may lead to some certain misdiagnosis. Among them is convulsion, so you can get convulsive syncope, and that's not uncommon. Uh, visual and auditory hallucinations are described with syncope, so they, they're not necessarily seizures. Uh, you can get syncope even when lying down, although that would be that would be less common. Abdominal pain may occur at onset. Pallor and sweating are very useful. So all this ask, you know, how did the patient look just before he fell? And more, more often than not, you'll say, oh, he looked. That you you get the answer. Oh, he looked. Uh, he or she looked very pale. And sometimes uh, the recovery from uh, syncope may not be um, as rapid. Things not to miss if you have a syncopal uh, 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 patient are uh, cardiac causes, right? And you, you, I'm sure, will be much better at reading ECGs than 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 me. So you know, Brugada syndrome is is a particular uh, reasonably rare syndrome, genetic syndrome where. Uh, they they have these um, you know abnormal EEG. There are three types with um, you know the various changes as you see in there, um, all involving some some sort of um, ST elevation. The first type being a coved type, the second type being a saddle type. You know, um, uh, but but try and get if you if you're suspecting something like this, you know, get get a good family history because often. They may have some sort of family history of sudden cardiac death or sudden infant death syndrome. Um, as compared to adults, uh, those uh, kids with Brugada syndrome tend to have less, uh, uh, more, more conduction delays, and they tend to have more ventricular tachycardia than uh, ventricular fibrillation. Other uh, cardiac causes of syncope not, not to miss include would include things like uh, your long QT syndrome. I'm sure most people are familiar with this, and your uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and uh, you should get some clues. To that from your again from your ECG. Another important uh, uh, and not uncommon uh, misdiagnosis in ED will be this uh, uh, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, or also known as PNES. And again, there can be some features to help um, uh, uh, to distinguish, and you, you find this in in all sorts of uh, uh, textbooks and, and presentations. Uh, but I think one, one of the things that you can try uh, uh, and do uh, or, or, or clues that you can, for me, that you uh, that might make you think this might be a uh, uh, penis is usually the movements are bizarre. Uh, whereas, you know, seizures are often more, uh, more stereotyped and, 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 and more limited. With, with uh, penis, you can set all, all sorts of movements. And, uh, some of these uh, behaviors are suggestible. So, so if if it was the uh, medical officer attending the, the the patient, he may he or she may be having you know some abnormal movements, and and the frequency and amplitude of the movements may increase when the specialist comes, and and he may go into a status. Uh, psychogenicus when the consultant comes. So there's some degree of uh, suggestibility uh, in, 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 in this condition. Having said that, uh, you just need to be a bit careful because some patients may have both uh, penis and proper epilepsy. And, and we've had that uh, in, in the past as well. So we we'll always go back to the history. And, and in some cases, in some rare cases, you do need uh, prolonged video EEG monitoring to, uh, to distinguish between these two episodes. How are we doing the time? Okay, we're halfway through. Okay, so now this is just a, it's just a, a clue for me to go on to the next half of the talk, which is to uh, talk about some, a few conditions that perhaps we should be thinking of when you see patients in ED 
uh, kids with ED with, with seizures. Uh, the first being, um, you know, your febrile seizures. So that's probably what you're going to be dealing with most. And I'm sure uh, you're aware of the recommendations uh, when you have patients with febrile seizures. So in an otherwise well kid with a simple febrile seizure, you don't even need to do electrolytes or glucose, right? Um, um, but when they have meningeal signs, uh, or if you think they've got incomplete immunization, or they've had you know, some sort of antibiotics prior to the presentation with seizure in your ED, then you should seriously consider doing, doing a lumbar puncture because these are kids who may be hovering uh, you know, a meningo encephalitis. Uh, you don't need to do EEG uh, in, in, in normal children with simple febrile fits. So that's what's said in this action statement. But in fact, even in even if the even if the uh, uh, even if it was if it was a complex febrile seizure or recurrent simple febrile seizure, EEG is still not indicated because it's it's not it's simply not not helpful. Um, uh, and neuroimaging should not be performed as the routine evaluation in uh, children with simple febrile seizures. So I think mo most of you will be happy. Uh, you know, you may admit the kid with uh, uh, febrile seizures for observation and all that, but, but uh, other than that, uh, they, they need little else. However, when you have febrile seizures with um, significant headache in the older kids or neck stiffness, or photophobia, or, or, or smaller kids have got bulging fontanelle, uh, they're a bit irritable, they've got, they've got um, you know, altered awareness, that's, that's when you need to worry. Um, um, and I, I think most people will, will automatically just cover them and, and treat uh, as if they had meningo encephalitis, even if they could not get any uh, lumbar puncture. So I won't go into uh, detail for that, but they may also be having one of these uh, infection-associated encephalopathies. Um, and I'll just uh, give you a case example, real, real case example, actually. So this was a, a case uh, uh, two, three years ago uh, of a boy who had fever, uh, cough, and a bit of a runny nose. It's actually given uh, a rectal uh, non-steroidals at home because of the high fever. Uh, he got that from, uh, because the brother was unwell uh, uh, and, and was given this uh, uh, non-steroidals. Um, uh, the brother, in fact, uh, was uh, subsequently admitted with the influenza A uh, pneumonia. Sorry, influenza A. Um, uh, so this patient uh, then had another spike of fever that night. It was given another another rectal uh, non-steroidal anti uh, medication. I think it was uh, ibuprofen. Next day, he had uh, diarrhea and vomiting, and that's when he started to be a bit off, less responsive. Started to show some some stiffening. He's brought to a private hospital, uh, treated as seizures, given rectal diazepam. Following that, he he apparently regained uh, some consciousness and was almost back to his normal self, but still less active. Uh, and was therefore admitted to the ward. But by noon, uh, he, his GCS deteriorated, he became unresponsive, he had more seizures, and he was looking quite stiff. Uh, uh, the seizure was aborted by, by um, IV uh, uh, rectal diazepam, and he was quickly pushed to the emergency uh, uh, radiology for a CT scan. And this is what his CT shows. Um, can anyone um, uh, suggest what this might be? Can you see anything abnormal on the CT scan? A neck? Question mark? What's A neck? Any other offers? Cerebral edema, okay. I mean, you tend, you tend to get, the, the ventricles are quite generous and then you, you tend to get more slit-like uh, ventricles in cerebral edema. Uh, and and I, mean, I, don't, I mean, it's not the greatest of pictures, but you do still see the, um, 
you do still see the gray white differentiation there. So I, I wouldn't put uh, edema top top of the list. But yeah, um, I think I think the first answer got it because you can see this um, hypodense uh, over the, the thalamic region exactly, Dr. Nina, and that's uh, that's typical of uh, you know changes you see in ANEC. Um, and 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 unfortunately, this boy just uh, uh, deteriorated further. He had dystonia, you know, signs of uh, um, um, basal ganglia dysfunction, uh, and 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 he had further imaging, which which just uh, highlighted the the abnormality even even more strikingly. So very uh, swollen and and hyper intense um, uh, thalami bilaterally. Uh, there are also some other uh, areas involved, but, but it's mainly the it's mainly the thalamus. And and unfortunately, this boy actually uh, uh, passed away from from his illness. Um, so yes, the, he has he's got a neck, and that's that is that is an example of of this uh, infection associated encephalopathies. There are many others, but 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 a neck is one, and it's uh, characterized by encephalopathy preceded by a viral febrile illness uh, with rapid deterioration in the, in the level of consciousness. This, the CSF is usually not, uh, not uh, very uh, helpful. Uh, you don't tend to get any cells in the, in the CSF. Uh, the imaging is, is characteristic. It can, it, so much so that often you can make the diagnosis of is they may have Uh, Dr. Ahmad, are you there? Oh, I think he got disconnected. Oh, uh, Dr. Ahmad, can you share again? Okay. Wait. Uh, banyak terlepas ke? Ah, uh, no, no, no. Uh, I no. Okay. All right. Um, uh, so, so as I was saying, the, the other potential differential is uh, Japanese encephalitis, but, but uh, other than that, I think uh, this disappearance is rather, rather uh, characteristic of the ANEC. There are other examples of um, um, infection-associated encephalopathies, and that includes things like um, um, AESD. Um, don't worry about it if you haven't heard it, but, uh, you know, acute... Uh, uh, encephalopathy with biphasic seizures and restricted diffusion. That's one example. You can have uh, you can have uh, MERS, not not the MERS CoV, but but uh, encephalopathy with uh, reversible splenial lesions. So they get abnormalities in the in the in the splenium. Those are milder, but but ANEC is one of the one of the more severe severe ones. You can also sometimes get uh, uh, you know in association with fever and seizures. The para or post-infectious encephalopathies, uh, and and this next example is an example of one. This was an older kid, eight years old, who had history of fever, uh, followed by headache, uh, vomiting, and altered behavior. And, and, and GCS was, you know, uh, low-ish. An example to ED. So there's lots of lots of. Um, uh, red flags already, and of course, this was also, you know, beyond the febrile seizure age range. <clears throat> uh, he had brisk reflexes, uh, so he ended up with a with a CT quite early on, but the initial CT was uh, apparently normal. He ceased further in ED. Uh, his GCS dropped, and he was intubated for uh, cerebral protection. Uh, he had a lumbar puncture the next day. Um, there was only four white blood cells. Um, uh, everything else was normal. Clinically, he had features of cerebral edema. So, uh, you know, hypertension, not bradycardia, but, but, but hypertension. And, and in fact, uh, I think he was in an ICU where the intensivist was good at, uh, you know, looking at mitral cerebral um, artery flow and all that. And it was felt that uh, the flow was not great. 
and he also had a poor uh, recovery such that the uh, length of um, uh, cerebral protection needed to be extended and, and therefore he had, uh, he had a brain MRI done subsequently. Um, can anyone uh, offer, uh, I, don't, I don't expect you to, to get this right, but if you do, it's, um, it's a bonus. Any offers? Maybe a bit of a lag uh, from the typing and it appearing. Okay. Hyperintensity over the periventricular region. Uh, not not quite periventricular, uh, but but um, well well yes the over the right side here yes there is, uh, but but you know everyone else is is okay but there is I agree uh, right uh, periventricular and anteriorly, uh, but more more impressively is this um, uh, basal ganglia which again looked uh, a bit swollen, and there's high signal. And there's high signal over the over the telomere as well, which this really should be should be darker than, than this. And uh, higher up, you know, your white matter should be uniformly dark on a T2 sequence, but he's got patches of white within the white matter on a T2 sequence. So that's uh, suggestive of uh, demyelination. So in fact, this boy has got uh, has got uh, ADEM. Uh, had, it's got features of ADEM, and you'll see later that he fulfills the criteria. Um, and, and in fact, interestingly, this boy then developed arrhythmias, raised inflammatory markers, and he had features of MISC. And, and true enough, his uh, COVID antibody returned uh, positive. Uh, and the, when, we, when the history was obtained again, the, the, the family was uh, positive for COVID uh, some months back, but he, he never had symptoms of uh, COVID. So this boy had um, had ADEM, uh, and then the criteria for ADEM uh, are you know a first polyfocal uh, CNS event with presumed inflammatory and demyelinating cause. Uh, uh, encephalopathy is a must. You must have encephalopathy to diagnose ADEM. Um, uh, brain abnormalities typically are consistent with demyelination. And to be certain that it's ADEM, actually, um, uh, you need uh, to follow up and make sure he doesn't develop um, new lesions and new symptoms because ADEM or what looks like ADEM may in fact be a start of um, you know, a, a recurrent demyelinating event such as uh, multiple sclerosis and some of these other, some of these other demyelinating conditions. Um, just one other red flag for febrile seizures uh, that I'd like to uh, share this, this morning is if you've got somebody with who comes with uh, febrile seizures repeatedly, but mostly you know when they come they've got they, they are they are in status so recurrent febrile status or they have you know hemiconvulsive uh, seizures during the febrile illness. If you've got uh, you know an infant behaving in this way having high seizure frequency, are there any uh, diagnoses that you might uh, consider? This would be for you know gold award participants. <coughs> right, who's gonna claim the gold award, gold medal? <coughs> Do you know of any syndrome behaving in this way? And not Gesto, not quite. I'll give you a bronze for trying. Are you seeing any gold medalists? among our EP people today, going once, going twice. It's, it's a rare, it's a rare condition. I don't, I don't expect you to find it, but this, this is a condition known as uh, febrile seizure plus. You, you get, you get a silver medal for that. That's, that's a good effort. Uh, you, you recognize that perhaps this is not uh, somebody behaving in a normal uh, febrile seizure way, but in fact, this, this patient, Drave, whoa. Finally, gold medalist. Uh, so Dravet syndrome is a severe myoclonic epilepsy infancy, and that, that's the history that is 
rather suggestive when you have frequent febrile seizures, especially if this yeah, status, um, uh, if the seizures are, are, are also hemichronic in nature. So those, those score very highly on the, on the list of um, Grave features. Um, they then start to have um, uh, unprovoked seizures after the first year of life. Um, and they may be of um, different types, myoclonic or focal seizures. They may also have some uh, atypical absences. Um, and they usually um, have some sort of uh, developmental regression if the seizures are, are, are poorly controlled. Um, EEG is not specific. They, they can be abnormal later on. Uh, MRI is not helpful, it's usually normal, but the most important uh, uh, investigation if you have uh, suspicion would be a genetic testing, uh, looking for uh, SCN1A mutation and, and IMR can do this, but you know, even, even genetic panels uh, of epilepsy, you know, you can, you can, you can get it quite, quite easily nowadays. And that will show you know, loss uh, uh, mutation at SCN1A in the majority of cases. And the importance of recognizing this is because there is, uh, there is uh, a mutation causing loss of uh, sodium channel function. If you give uh, uh, medications that, the anti-epileptic medications that block the sodium channel, such as phenytoin and lamotrigine, you can sometimes worsen the seizures. So um, uh, often we don't recommend uh, the use of uh, phenytoin even in, in, in ED, if you've got somebody where you suspect drug based syndrome. So that's your fabulous year. And I just wanna, before I end, uh, I know Dr. Kursi had a wonderful uh, talk on, um, you know, uh, head, head trauma, but I wanna specifically talk a, a little bit about um, uh, abusive head trauma or non-accidental injury and, and, and things that, you know, uh, can uh, uh, perhaps you can pick up in, in the emergency department uh, because they uh, can present with seizures and you would get clues from the history. You know, if you've got bruising, especially in this uh, you know, 10 4 uh, uh, pattern uh, in your torso, your ears, in your neck, in any old child under the age of four, you, sh you should be suspicious. Uh, this might be a bit severe trauma or bruising to any child younger than four months should you know, send alarm bells, ring, alarm bells ringing. And you know, if you've got additionally uh, symptoms like uh, diarrhea, poor feeding, irritability, you know, altered consciousness, all, all, all those should, should make you alert the possibility of uh, abusive head trauma. And of course, you, the, the you know, other things like your red retinal injury, but you would be more suspicious when you know when you when you review the imaging, right, or, or your skeletal skeletal survey, and, and that's what I want to uh, uh, just spend a little bit of time on, um, you know, because uh, uh, you want to look for skull fractures, and skull fractures can be can be quite subtle, as as shown here. There's just the tiny uh, uh, parietal fracture there. Uh, if your radiologist can, can do this reconstruction, sometimes the fracture just shows up a bit more uh, uh, clearly as, as shown in the white arrow there, as opposed to the more normal uh, uh, parietal sutures. Um, so you need a bone window and perhaps this uh, a volume rendering or 3D CT image to, to help in, in cases of uncertainty. But, but uh, you know, what, what we should also be, or, or more commonly be, one thing to look out for would be uh, for subdural hemorrhages, right? Because that's that's the most common uh, finding uh, on CT in patients with abusive head trauma. Um, I mean, we are we are uh, classically taught uh, blood on CT is bright, right? And that's that's true for for acute uh, subdural hemorrhage um, in, in most circumstances. But if it is a hyperacute uh, hemorrhage, meaning you know it's just uh, occurred, uh, the the signal may be isoattenuating. So you might you might not see a bright signal on on, on a CT. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, SDH due to abusive head trauma more often than not have got mixed bright and low signal, as you see here on the right. You've got a layer of uh, a layer of a bright signal, um, and uh, and uh, you know a darker signal there. And here again, you see you see bright signal at the at the midline, uh, 
uh, with a with a darker signal uh, underneath. So this this mixed uh, signal on the opposite hemisphere is mostly hypo attenuating. It's still a subdural hemorrhage, and so you would have thought, oh, perhaps this is something that's recurrent. Uh, you know, bright is new, the old one may be old, uh, but. In actual fact, CT is not 100% reliable in, in timing the ages of SDH. Uh, so just, just be, be a bit careful about uh, you know, some, saying somebody, this is an acute on chronic or whatever, uh, because uh, the timing can be, can be a bit tricky. What are the other clues of, uh, of abusive head trauma? Or, or you know, how, how, do we, how can we pick SDHs uh, especially the milder ones. Um, so sometimes uh, the SDH, uh, the mild ones can be a bit more difficult to, to, to uh, pick up, but look for you know, changes in the interhemispheric region or high convexity and over at the posterior fossa, because those, those areas are uh, classical areas uh, associated with uh, um, you know, abusive head trauma. Um, and, and therefore, you may want to, uh, to reformat your scans. So you won't, you, it will be difficult to see it on, on your axial imaging. You may need to reformat it into your coronal or even your sagittal uh, imaging. And, and, and you can do that. You, you, don't, need, you don't need to, uh, if, you've got, if you've got a soft copy of the, of the CT scan, you can do it. Uh, if you're working in RCH, uh, not RCH, in, uh, in uh, Hospital Tunku Aziza, uh, so in our, our uh, Siemens spec system, you, you look for this uh, um, uh, round icon, you press on it, and then it should give you some options uh, whether you want to do an MPR, MPR sequence. And, and this will, it will then show you this, and you can, you, you can play around with the axial or, or sagittal. But if you don't have a PEC system like this, you can just get you know, uh, a DICOM reader freely online. Uh, one example is this, um, uh, is this uh, Radiant. Is it written there? Uh, yeah. So up here, Radiant DICOM viewer is a small program. You can just download it. And, um, and uh, you know, similarly, uh, if you have a scan, you can, you can then use this feature, 3D MPR, and when you click on that, you can, you can get the sequences. So, so that, that, you know, in, in the more subtle cases, when you have, uh, you know, views, um, coronal views and gentle, sagittal views, you have a higher chance of picking up um, uh, the, the more subtle subdural hemorrhages. Sometimes uh, uh, there may be associated um, uh, changes on the brain parenchyma uh, in cases of SDH. So you can see the SDH here uh, over the right uh, frontal uh, region. But additionally, this patient has got a reversal sign. So normally your cerebrum is lighter compared to your cerebellum, right? But in this, in this image, uh, the cerebellum looks brighter. In fact, the cerebellum is, is, has a normal signal, but the cerebrum, the whole of the cerebrum has got, um, has got diffuse hypodensity, uh, indicative of uh, hypoxic, uh, hypoxic uh, injury. So that would be also a helpful sign to suggest, uh, you know, this may be uh, abusive head trauma. Uh, uh, some other more subtle signs in abusive head trauma you may sometimes see this pattern. So in addition to the um, subdural uh, hemorrhage, you might get this uh, thrombosed bridging vein, uh, which would appear, you know, uh, brighter, you know, floating in your subdural hemorrhage. Um, and, and sometimes you may also see uh, sedimentation of the hemorrhage, you know, lower down at, at the back here. One last sign you may want to look for uh, especially if you can reformat your CT scan, is look for retroclival hemorrhages. So if you've got this hemorrhage, you know, just in front of your brainstem here. So on the first scan, it was a CT on day two. It looks, uh, it looks um, 
uh, intermediate in density, but it has changed to something brighter. So these are these are subtle signs, but you know if you know what to look for, uh, this would be very helpful. And apparently, up to thirty percent of uh, uh, cases of um, abusive head trauma may have may show this retroclival uh, hemorrhages. Um, in ED, sometimes seizures may be a sign of stroke. Uh, although, you know, more classically, you know, you want you want to you know ask through these uh, screening questions is whether whether there's any uh, facial asymmetry, whether there's any hand weakness or slurred speech. You know, these are uh, things that adults use as screening for, for in, in in the community, and you can still can still use it uh, for uh, children as well. Uh, but but sometimes you do run into difficulties. Uh, because in children there are a bit more, uh, there are many more mimics of strokes, uh, and, and some clues to you know uh, favoring strokes will be a uh, patient who was uh, completely well before the presentation with this with these fast uh, uh, symptoms, uh, patients who cannot walk, or patients who've got definite uh, face and arm weakness, they, they they are more likely to have proper strokes. Um, uh, you may also run into trouble uh, distinguishing between uh, thoughts paralysis, which is uh, weakness following seizure. Uh, but, but clues will be, you know, thoughts will be always post -sictal. So you should, if you don't have, if you don't have any definite history of seizure, you can't say somebody has had a thoughts paralysis. Uh, the, the weakness must be the same side as, as the seizure. Uh, it shouldn't last too long. I mean, uh, people, uh, studies have shown that it can last an average of 15 hours. But to me, I think even that is a bit long. I'd be a bit uh, uncomfortable to, to say somebody has got thoughts when, when the weakness lasts uh, that long. It's usually just a matter of hours before uh, the power returns. And this is the last uh, condition that I just want to share. Um, uh, this and these are patients who can also present with seizures and uh, they are babies or, or bigger kids with uh, venous thrombosis and they can be difficult to pick up but clues will be uh, if they've had you know um, uh, in the young ones you know encephalop altered behavior altered mental status in the bigger bigger children if they have a headache vomiting and, and some of them may have a six nerve palsy the risk factors for venous thrombosis would include uh, you know, being a neonate, because the highest risk, uh, the highest incidence of venous thrombosis is in the neonatal period, where you tend to get, you know, um, uh, dehydration, and you get, you get, um, you know, very high uh, hemoglobin levels and all that. Uh, children with acute head and neck infections are at risk of uh, venous thrombosis, and children with chronic diseases carrying, you know, uh, increased risk of thromb thromboembolism, such as your, your nephrotic syndromes or congenital heart disease, your, your leukemic patients. Um, um, and and the, 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 the sign to look for on a plain CT is a dense clot sign. So on a plain CT, you wanna look for something that's bright. Uh, if it's the superior sagittal sinus that's thrombosed, you wanna look at the back here. Um, uh, so it's a dense clot sign on a plain CT. And if you have a contrast CT, you should have an empty delta sign. So, you know, by right, if there wasn't any thrombosis, all the, everything here should be bright, okay? But because of the thrombus in the middle, the contrast, uh, you know, is uh, compressed. Or, well, well you, you see, you can see the thrombus with the contrast surrounding it. So that's known as the, that's known as the um, empty delta sign. And, and you should just um, really scroll through the images from top to bottom. And, and as you follow this image, this is again the case of uh, uh, superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. You can see the bright picture in the middle and right at the top, it's much more clear that uh, this is a this is a plain CT. You can see this uh, dense um, hyperdense signal, suggestive of uh, superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. I think that's my uh, last slide. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so I hope I've shared a few uh, mimics, seizure mimics that uh, may end up in ED and and.
shared with you some some conditions that you may want to consider when 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 the kid uh, present with um, uh, seizures in the emergency department, and I'm happy to answer some questions. Yes, yeah, so Thelma, we have uh, two questions from Nina. Mm -hmm. So, what is the temperature threshold for a child to develop febrile seizure? First question, and the second one, is there any suggestion of the number of seizures that we that a child might have that we need to consider referral to a pediatric team for suspicion of Dravet syndrome? Yeah, uh, so, yeah. Great, great questions. I mean, um, I think. Uh, uh, Typically, it's it's a temperature above 38 uh, or 38.5 that tend to trigger seizures. But you know, febrile seizures most typically occur not so much because of the actual temperature, but the rate at which the temperature rises. And you often you often get the history uh, of febrile seizures. Mum say, "Eh, dia tak demam pun masa masa dia sawan, tapi lepas sawan dia demam." So it's actually the actually the the initial initial. Um, um, Increase in temperature. That's that's uh, uh, more important. If you get uh, kids with uh, febrile seizures, even with lower temperatures, that's 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 okay. That's not necessarily. That doesn't necessarily mean that they've got uh, they've got um, an underlying epilepsy. Uh, as to the second question, how many how many uh, numbers? Uh, there's no actual numbers. Well, well in fact, there, there, are, there is a scoring system known as the Hattori score. Let me just type that. Hattori score. So um, I, I think in that, uh, if you've got more than five uh, in the first year, you score more marks. But the Hattori scoring system reflects you know the features um, uh, of uh, Dravet. So if you've got a status, you score very highly. If you've got frequent seizures, more than five in the first year of life, you score very highly. If you've got hemiconvulsive seizures, you score very highly. If you've got uh, what is known as a hot hot bath or hot water seizures, so so uh, these these patients with Dravet are quite sensitive, and, and in Japan and in many other countries, they, when they when they bathe their kids in in hot water or, or you know. I, I saw them and they, they tend to have seizures. So if you've got that feature, you also score quite highly on the on, on the uh, scoring. So you've got high scores, that's reason enough to um, uh, to refer. But even, you know, if you don't have high score, but you've got a, just a suspicion after listening to this talk, you want to refer, we're quite happy to, we're quite happy to accept the referral and assess the patient. Yeah, that's a good question. Is there any cutoff period for post sector drowsiness? I mean, I I um, I uh, don't have the exact answer, and I, I can't remember if I've come across any exact figures. But it shouldn't last longer than a couple of hours, by right. If you've got somebody, you know, not recovering after two hours or so, you should you should you should be concerned, or at the very least, you know. Uh, monitor more closely and look for look for subtle signs because sometimes what happens is um, it's not just postictal. Some of them may have had you know rectal diazepam or even for those who've had uh, uh, seizures which are uh, slightly longer, you may have given phenytoin or phenobarbitone. So you want to take into account those uh, uh, features as well. Uh, but you know, if it's a simple febrile seizures. Uh, drowsiness lasting lasting hours is uh, you know should 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 get your bells ringing. Okay. Oh, from Edmund Lim, any experience with children developing seizures while having COVID nineteen or post COVID? I just gave a talk yesterday on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely, and I think this Omicron. Is, is, is causing a lot more febrile seizures in, in the positive kids. So uh, Dr. C. Kui Ching from, uh, from Hospital Slayang just gave me some, some figures in his ward. In February, they had uh, 32 admissions for just simple febrile seizures uh, because of COVID. But in, in March, and that's when we saw the spike of, of uh, Omicron, uh, the, the admission for simple febrile seizures uh, almost tripled. 
Um, and and we in the neurology have been have been getting uh, uh, referrals for unusual uh, neurological uh, uh, complications following uh, COVID infection. It's mostly all um, uh, post infectious or para infectious. So it's not a direct virus. It's not the direct COVID virus causing uh, the the infection. And and we see a spectrum. Uh, in fact, the the ADEM and the ANEC MRIs that I show in this talk were of uh, COVID patients. Uh, we also saw, uh, you know, more, more unusual um, uh, encephalopathy such as uh, this AESD, acute encephalopathy with biphasic sheet seizures. There's also one with HHE, uh, hemiplegia, hemiconvulsive epilepsy syndrome. So we are, we are seeing some, you know, unusual uh, neurological uh, complications. What is your opinion in the usage of pinobarb after failure of phenytoin as part of status epilepticus treatment as levetiracetam is usually not available in ED? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I completely agree. You got to use what you have. And in fact, um, in the setting of uh, febrile status, we find phenobarb is much more effective, even, even more effective than, than, than phenytoin. Um, there's this uh, rare uh, condition known as fires. So this is a uh, fever uh, or fever induced uh, refractory epilepsy uh, syndrome. Uh, so these, these are kids who, who develop uh, status epilepticus, uh, which are refractory following a febrile illness. So often these patients only respond to extremely high uh, doses of phenobarbitone. So these are kids who are on something like 20 milligrams per kilo per day of phenobarbitone before the series can be controlled. So yeah, I think, I think in children in particular, phenobarbitone as second line or, or third line rather. So you'll have your benzo as first line, phenytoin as second line. Phenobarb as third line is, is, perfectly, is perfectly acceptable. I mean, the, the you know, levetiracetam is, is highly rated. And, and there are good reasons for that. It's a, it's a clean drug. It doesn't cause interactions and all that. And it's quite, it's quite effective in certain situations, but it's certainly not superior to phenobarbital. That, that much I can say. Um, even in neonates, uh, the, the, the studies in, in children, it's not superior. It's, it's got better pharmacokinetic uh, properties. Uh, but in, uh, in terms of stopping seizures, it's not better than phenytoin or uh, phenobarbital, I think. Any other questions from the participants? Yeah. Okay. No more? Wonderful. No more. Thank you all. So is this something that you have every month, uh, Nina, or every week, or...? <laughs> Oh yeah, we have it every month. Uh, yes, oh, because because I think uh, from your experience, uh, not many people like neurology, right? So we want to basically um, prevent neurophobia and promote neurophilia, I guess. Fantastic. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, yeah, we'll be covering, we're covering adults uh, and also pediatric, but uh, I think I listened through your lecture when uh, the UKM team did... Um, the epilepsy talk and I think it was fantastic. I learned a lot from that. Um, that's why I think that maybe we should have this kind of session. The, the videos that you showed, um, it could have been like mistakenly taken as uh, something else which is benign or you know something benign being interpreted as something which is not good and yeah. being referred to pit. So I think we need to have this kind of knowledge sharing inshallah in the future more often I guess. Great. Yeah. So is there is there such a thing as a neuro neuro emergency subspecialty? Uh, we are promoting our um, our special interest group. It has just been endorsed by the uh, College of Emergency Physicians. Okay. Um, yes. Um, thank you so much for the um, uh, understanding seniors up there who are supporting us. So hopefully we will be able to um, um, flourish further and. Uh, Hopefully, in a few years to come, we can have a neurological emergency conference um, with God's will, inshallah. Okay. Thank you. All right.